This segment of IWCR is brought to you by Texaco Haviland Formula 3. Add more life to your car. Some said it would never happen. The return of driver Ernie Irvin. It's an amazing story. 13 months ago, doctors gave him little chance of surviving his crash at the Michigan International Speedway. But on Friday, Ernie returned. He qualified seventh for today's Tyson Holly Farms 400. Bill Weber has the story from North Wilkesboro, where Ted Musgrave picks up his first pole of 1995. Bill. Thanks, Randy, and welcome to North Wilkesboro, everyone, where a lot has unfolded this week. Ted Musgrave with his first pole of the season, final short track event of the year. A lot of big-name teams miss this race, but nothing has overshadowed the emotional and exciting return of Ernie Irvin to the Winston Cup Series. Beginning on Friday, Ernie was back in the spotlight. He was concentrating on his car, the media concentrating on him. Ernie patiently balanced his time, practicing his Thunderbird, and answering endless questions from the press. When it came time to qualify, Ernie's number 88 Haviland Ford rolled out to a standing ovation. And he didn't disappoint the fans or himself, landing seventh in the starting grid at 117.641 miles per hour. If they had a boat a year and a half ago, ah, we'd like to get Ernie Irvin out of here because it'd get us one more position. But now they're like, man, this could happen to us. And we, we really would like to see him ha come back. And, you know, this is just one more hurdle, but, you know, the fan support has been remarkable, and uh, that's what's enabled us to be able to uh, keep, keep our chin up. Ted Musgrave chased down his first pole of the season, bumping teammate Mark Martin to second with a speed of 118.396 miles per hour. These two cars have struggled in recent weeks. Uh, can you turn it around here? That's what we're hoping for, you know, uh, maybe a new outlook starting on the front row, and I don't know, I hope so. You know, we need a little luck, and, you know, we've been in the top five most of the season, and I sure would like to finish there and get in the IROC series. And, but then again, look behind me, you know, that's two past champions, Rusty Wallace and uh, Terry Labonte on me, and they got by me last week on points, but we're fighting hard to get back again. Dara Waltrip had another strong qualifying run. The Western Auto Chevy starts fourth. DW hasn't visited Victory Lane in 95 races, but he's hoping to turn that around today. Everybody's waiting. Number 85 could be here. Could be, could be Sunday. <laughs> it could be. Uh, this is as good as I've been, and I, I can't remember last time I had uh, the, the car this good. Uh, we were real good at Martinsville earlier this year, and we've been good a couple other places, but this is the first time I'm really happy, and I can sleep. I slept real good. I qualified up front, and, you know, you got to start up front if you're going to finish up front, so... I'm optimistic. Anything is one of my favorite racetracks. I've won a lot here, and it gives you a lot of confidence. Good luck. I need it, bud. Just no bad luck. No bad luck. I don't need any good luck. I just don't need any bad luck. Among the seven drivers that did not qualify for the Holly Farms 400, Jeff Burton, Ward Burton, Todd Bodine, Jeremy Mayfield, and Mike Wallace. The Wood Brothers have signed Michael Waltrip to a two-year contract. He'll replace Morgan Shepard next season. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. Uh, we had talked to Michael off and on for the last couple of three years about doing something, and um, the opportunity come, up, you know, come about, so we just decided to go ahead and do it now, and, um, you know, we're looking forward to it. Mike Bliss won his first super truck race Saturday, aided by veteran Winston Cup crew chief Barry Dotson. And take a good look at the old North Carolina Motor Speedway. You won't recognize the refreshed Rockingham track when the series rolls in there three weeks from now. What we tried to do is do something for everybody. We tried to do something for the media, tried to do something for the competitors, and definitely something for the fans. And I think that uh, everybody that comes back here in October, if you look in any little corner and, and every little nook, you're going to find something new. And uh, that's what we wanted to do. And this is just the beginning of many more things. Now, we'll have more from Rockingham later on in the show. Now, I talked with several teams and confirmed with NASCAR. There should be plenty of tires to go around today, but those tires fall off in a hurry. So watch for a dramatic difference in lap times after, say, just five or ten laps. Now, this is normally a very aggressive race, and you should see plenty of that here today. Several teams need a win. Several big-name teams need a top-ten finish to impress their sponsor. You could feel the pressure in this garage area on Saturday when some of the brightest young stars in this sport missed this race. Green flag shortly after 1 o'clock. Get well wishes to Richard Bostick, the gas man on the 40 team. He's recovering from knee surgery. Randy, back to you. Thanks, Bill. Today, certainly a day we've all been waiting for with the return of Ernie. But there are a bunch of guys that are going to make it tough on him 
to return to Victory Lane today. Let's take a look at the top 10 qualifiers. There's Ted Musgrave and teammate Mark Martin on row one. Bobby Hamilton, one of the hottest drivers on the circuit, will start third. Daryl Waltrip, trying to break that drought, goes off fourth. Michael Waltrip goes off fifth in the Pennzoil Pontiac. And there's Dale Jarrett, his teammate Ernie Irvin, right behind him in the Texaco Havlin Ford. Kenny Schrader goes off eighth, and Morgan Shepard, Sterling Marlin round out the top ten. Dale Earnhardt hopes to avoid trouble today as he tries desperately to gain ground on Jeff Gordon in the chase for the Winston Cup championship. Earnhardt has won ten of eleven career races that he has started from 13th. He'll try to make that 11 for 12 today. We need to take a break. Ned will join you in a moment. As we leave you, here's the rest of today's starting lineup from North Wilkesboro. brand new enclosed garage area is one of the new improvements here at the North Carolina Motor Speedway. Rusty Wallace has had a lot of success on this one mile track and he'll rank among the favorites when we come back here for the AC Delco 400 in a few weeks. Some people might think that Rusty has not had a good year in 1995, but going into the Wilkesboro weekend, he has two victories and ranks fifth in the NASCAR Winston Cup point standings. Randy Pemberton profiles the Miller Genuine Draft team and its driver. Rusty Wallace and his Penske South Racing Team roared into 1995 with high hopes of taking home the prestigious Winston Cup title. Along the way would surely be several showings in the winner's circle. A scene that this team had grown accustomed to after winning a staggering 18 events the previous two years. But by the time the tour got through Atlanta, rumblings of rule changes to help combat an apparent aerodynamic advantage of the new Chevrolet Monte Carlo were running rampant through the garage area. And Rusty was right in the middle of Ford's fight for more downforce. Something many considered the catalyst for Chevy sweeping the first seven races. Ironically, it was Rusty that stopped Chevy's streak at seven when his Ford rolled to victory lane in Martinsville at the end of April. It was 16 races before Rusty and the Brew Crew would celebrate in victory lane again. I can sit here in, in, in both these hands and count up that many races I probably should have won. You can look at the Brickyard 400, a full straightaway lead and had it wrapped up and have a crash on pit road. You can look at Michigan, the first race, when we had a pit for fuel. You can look at Pocono when I had pit for fuel after big leads. You can look at Dover, Delaware after first lap crash there and, and, and come back and get two laps back and have the quickest car. There's so many times that I could have, but I didn't. And during their summer drought, many people outside the Penske organization pointed to new crew chief Robin Pemberton as the reason for the team's failure to find victory lane. But according to Rusty, that's just not the case. I keep telling people, and they keep trying to lay this thing off in Robin, and it's really getting, it's getting under my skin because Robin is the best guy we've ever had at Penske Racing. Now, I'm not saying that because he's your brother. He just flat ass is. He's really good with the shocks. He's really good with team morale. He's really good with aerodynamics, and he's a wonderful guy. We're both the same age. We drink together. We party together. We race hard together. It reminds me of the days of Barry Dodson and me when we were together. So that's done. We're definitely a better team. I know that. Statistically speaking, it was only a matter of time before this team would probably stumble a little bit, not win all the races, or something would happen. And you know, this happened to be the rule, I, or this happened to be the way it worked out this year. You know, I had, uh, I never had any reservations of coming over here. I knew it was going to be hard. You know, Buddy's got big shoes to fill, but we're two completely different types of people, so we run run things differently. And. Uh, you know, I would be upset if I was looking at this as a short-term thing. I mean, this is a long-term thing, not just Penske Racing, but the entire Penske organization. You know, it's it's a great organization to be in. And, uh, you know, you just sometimes you just have to take your lumps, you know, and it goes that way. Other than the acquisition of Pemberton, the team has had little turnover over the years. Todd Parrott is still there with Rusty, one of his buddies from the Blue Max days. 
Todd leads a long list of people who put their heart and soul into their work. The guys back at the shop, Gary Brooks, Bill Wilburn, the guys that stay back and prepare the cars every week, you know, that don't get all the recognition. And we just bring it to the racetrack. I mean, we took a brand new car to Watkins Glen. I mean, brand spanking new, a car that I never even put a wrench on till we got to the test, unloaded it, and it was just like a second and a half faster than we ran last year. You know, and they set the car up, they did all that. So, you know, they, they you know, everybody does their job. All the guys in a fab shop, you know, building the cars, and we've got real nice cars, and them guys don't get a whole lot of credit, but they do a whole lot of work. So how did a team that was used to winning so often deal with the summer dry spell? When they have a problem, they live it with me. So any one of those guys at the shop, if they ever need anything, they can always rest assured that when they come to me, Rusty helps them, and I'll be happy to do that. And, and they know it's a big team effort, and so my team is perfect. My morale is sky high, and the real understanding. When you're sitting out there, and we're flying along, and we got a half a lap lead on the field, and they're all looking at the calculator, and they all know we got a pit for fuel, and they all know we're going to not make it. We all live and die together. But we can go home knowing that our performance was real high. And when the performance is low, and you're running bad, buddy, that's bad. Statistically, the team is behind compared to recent years, but still Rusty ranks third in top fives, tied with Terry Labonte with 11. And heading into North Wilkesboro, he's one of only seven drivers with two or more wins. We're, we're always there. We always got a shot at it, and sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot. But, I, you know, I, this has been a good year for us. And I, it's not over with you. Mm -hmm. I think that towards the end of the year, you're going to see us win a couple of more races, and then we'll, we'll just concentrate on beating the heck out of them next year. What does Rusty think of the rules, which have been massaged by NASCAR throughout the year, to even up the Chevy and the Fords? We definitely got the shaft early in the year. With the, with the cars, with the Chevrolet thing, but now it's a lot, lot closer. It's much closer. And it's so close now that it's not even worth complaining about or voice and opinion about to try to stick up for your rights. Because you got to do it. I mean, Richard Childress is down there just screaming like hell that the Fords are too good, and I'm down there screaming like hell that the, the Chevrolets are too good. And when we get done screaming, we can just put our arms around each other. And he's, he's a good guy. He fights for his rights, and I'm fighting for my rights. If the crew chief's bad, you fire him. If the driver's bad, you fire him. If the tire guys aren't doing right, you, you fire him. Or, or the pit crew is not doing right, you make changes there. When it comes to these, uh, these big-time issues, you, you're stuck with it, you know? And uh, you try to work with the manufacturer if, if that's the problem to make it better, you know? It's hard to, it's hard to fire Edsel Ford. <laughs> So Ford will be tweaking its T-Bird for 1996, and Rusty hopes he will take one to the title. And if he does, it will be an accomplishment shared among the team. And no one knows more than Rusty that it takes good individuals, and it takes good individuals that work together. You go, you get this interview done, you go interview any of those guys, and you ask them what they think of the Penske team, you think of me, and I'd be surprised if anything, anybody had anything bad to say, because, I mean... You know, we took a lot of heat because I took them all on the cruise last year. We went on the cruise and we weren't doing good at our so us because you guys screwed off and went on a cruise while we were working. <laughs> that was a bunch of baloney. But we look after our people. and yeah, we love them. They're good boys. They, they work hard for me and they, and, they, and they live and die with me. And that's, that, that's neat. Today's mailbox is brought to you by Miller Genuine Draft. Our question comes from Oren Conant of Ripon, Wisconsin. Two common causes for engine failure are burn pistons and dropped valves. Would you please explain the exact meaning of these two terms? Hi, I'm Mark Cronkins with Hendricks Motorsports, the tune-up man for the 18 car Interstate Battery Chevrolet. Uh, burn piston is actually when the piston actually disintegrates in the cylinder wall. They're, the rings are gone, the top of the piston's over half gone, and it just that's what we consider a burn piston. Actually, the fire actually blows it apart. And a drop valve is the head of the valve falls off of the stem of the valve and drops in the cylinder wall and bounces around in there and destroys the motor that way. Thanks for your question. If you have any race questions, write to us at Inside Winston Cup Racing, Box 240-417, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28224. If we use your question on the air, you'll receive this embroidered Miller Genuine Draft jacket. Meet John Boy and Billy, NASCAR's resident wise guys. These radio personalities have been keeping race teams and race fans laughing for years. 
Now you can order their entertaining four-tape collection by calling 1-800-471-STUFF. Call now 1-800-471-STUFF and hear for yourself. Next week, the Winston Cup Series returns to the Charlotte Motor Speedway for the UAW GM500. Expect plenty of news on and off the track. We'll have complete coverage from the Charlotte Motor Speedway next Sunday. Hi, I'm Darrell Walter, driver of the Western Auto Chevrolet. And you know, I don't think I've missed any of the inside Winston Cup racing shows since they've been on the air for the last 10 years. Just want to wish them a happy 10th and many, many more returns. One of the highlights of the AC Delco 400 weekend here at the North Carolina Motor Speedway is the annual Unical World Pit Crew Competition. The Ray Everham, Jeff Gordon crew won it last year. Of course, they'll be back to defend their title this year. And TNN always covers that competition for you. This week, the Speedway held a day for the media, including our IWCR crew, to see what it's like to make one of those fast pit stops. The excitement for the 1995 Unical World Pit Crew Championship was turned up on Tuesday when the North Carolina Motor Speedway offered a chance at 15 seconds of fame, a pit stop competition among various members of the media. The reigning World Pit Crew champions from the DuPont team served as coaches for five crews, all under tremendous peer pressure to perform. Our coach was Jackman Dave Denning. Basically, you want your arm against the tire, right. you'll rotate just like that. All right, go clockwise. Okay. Everyone was poised to perform because in addition to pride, some nice prizes were on the line. If you took a look at those plaques, uh, there's some incentive to win. That's a nice size plaque there. Got the lug nuts on it just like the actual pit competition trophy does. So it, it's a coveted prize to say the least. And our team coach is, is a pretty big guy. So if a fight breaks out, we've got an advantage there too, don't you think? Right. That's what we try to go with with our pit crew. We try to go with weight. We want the, the, the heaviest team. So if there's ever a problem, Jeff ever gets into a scuffle or something, we can back him up. After the real guys showed us how it's supposed to be done, it was time for practice. We watched the competition intently. Okay. Now go ahead and try and pull it off. Stay back. Just kind of get back out. We'll be all right. She'll push it a little bit further. We'll be right on. She'll start hitting the lug nuts. Just like we just did. Well, maybe, but just to be on the safe side, our crew tried to show its appreciation in advance of the competition. Inside Winston Cup. <laughs> <laughs> then the five-team event got underway. One loose lug nut in the rear. 46-56. Woo! <laughs> way to go, way to go, good job. 26-28. Finally, we lined up our team, led by Ned as crew chief. Randy and editor Scott Dallas were our tire changers. I took the role of gas man. Harry Kogan was one tire carrier. Pam Branner was our catch cam person. Pat Berger was our second tire carrier. And Kim Novak documented the stop on videotape that was later destroyed. 35-50. Your critique. You did well for the first time. The only thing you need to do is be slower and smoother, which will give you faster time. It's not as easy as it looks on TV, is it? Definitely not. Definitely not. You have to work hard at it, hard and steady. Will you still acknowledge us when we pass in the Winston Cup garage? Oh, by far. Oh, by far. Terrific. I will feel offended if you don't come up. Terrific. Thank you for your help. I enjoyed it. Definitely enjoyed it. I guess that didn't look too bad on TV, but the next time you see one of our guys at the racetrack, ask them about the outtakes. I guess they better not give up their day job. Well, our time's up for today. Hope you enjoyed the show. We're off to Charlotte. Maybe we'll see you there. Join us again here on TNN for more on Inside Winston Cup Racing. Today's show has been brought to you by Texaco Clean System 3 Gasolines. Add more life to your car. Cold-filtered Miller Genuine Draft, making the world a very cool place. And by Goodyear, number one in racing, number one in tires. Team Simpson is your ticket to be part of all the exciting racing action. Call 1-800-71-RACING to order the 1995 catalog and join Team Simpson today. The official conversion van of Inside Winston Cup Racing is Gladiator by Glavelle. America's number one luxury van, Glavelle. The way we put it together sets us apart.